support for CDBH and continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration or CDBH DF. First, let's start with some basic terms that describe the mechanisms by which fluid and solute can be transported with RRT. Diffusion is the movement of solute across a semi-permeable membrane down its concentration gradient. Ultrafiltration is the movement of plasma water across a semi-permeable membrane driven by a pressure gradient across the membrane. In this overview, we'll be talking about these three methods, hemodialysis, continuous venovenous hemofiltration, or CVVH, and continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration, or CVVH-DF. First, let's start with some basic terms that describe the mechanisms by which fluid and solute can be transported with RRT. Diffusion is the movement of solute across a semi-permeable membrane down its concentration gradient. Ultrafiltration is the movement of plasma water across a semi-permeable membrane driven by a pressure gradient across the membrane. And convection is the movement of solute dissolved in plasma water across a semi-permeable membrane. As the plasma is ultra-filtered, the dissolved solute is carried along by solvent drag. Now, what are the basic types of renal replacement therapy? Let's look at them one by one. With hemodialysis, the patient's blood is circulated past a semi-permeable membrane with dialysate solution on the other side. Plasma composition is altered primarily by diffusion of molecules down their concentration gradients to or from the dialysate solution. Plasma volume, as we'll see, can be decreased by ultrafiltration, and hemodialysis is performed in sessions that typically last between two and four hours. Here's a diagram of how hemodialysis works. Here's the semi-permeable membrane with the patient's blood on one side and dialysis solution on the other side. The membrane contains many tiny pores which hold back larger elements like proteins and blood cells but allow the small molecules to pass through. The dialysate contains low to zero concentrations of solutes that are to be removed like potassium, urea, and creatinine and higher than normal concentrations of substances that are to be added to the plasma, such as bicarbonate. Solutes that do not need to change much in concentration during dialysis, like sodium and calcium, are present in the dialysate at physiologic concentrations. Although the very first dialysis membranes were flat and about the size of a coffee table, current dialyzers achieve more surface area in a compact space by being made in the form of capillary-like hollow fibers with fenestrations along their entire length. The patient's blood flows through the capillaries and dialysate solution flows past the outsides of the fibers. Dialysis has been around for a long time, first being developed during World War II for use in soldiers with acute kidney injury. But in 1977, continuous renal replacement therapy methods were first developed that essentially spread the procedure of dialysis over 24 hours instead of doing it all in four. Today, the main methods of CRRT that we use are CVVH and CVVH-DF, and we'll look at a brief description of each. In continuous venovenous hemofiltration, or CVVH, venous blood flows at a slow rate through a hemofilter consisting of hundreds of semi-permeable capillary fibers, just like a dialyzer, but smaller. Negative external pressure can be used to create a gradient across the membrane that allows plasma water to be ultra-filtered and removed, dragging solute with it. The ultra-filtered plasma water, which contains all of its usual small solutes, such as sodium, creatinine, urea, and calcium, is replaced by a fluid similar to dialysate. Over the course of 24 hours, many liters of plasma water are gradually removed and replaced with urea and creatinine-free solution. Thus, solute and fluid balance is altered by a combination of ultrafiltration and convection. Convection can remove larger molecules than diffusion can. With hemodialysis and diffusion, for instance, only very small molecules, such as creatinine, molecular weight 113, urea 62, sodium 23, etc., can be efficiently removed. In CVVH, the use of convection allows the so-called middle molecules, 
molecular weight 500 to 60,000 to be removed as they are dragged through the semi-permeable membrane along with water. In continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration, or CVVHDF, hemofiltration occurs as described above, but the hemofilter is also exposed to dialysate so that the plasma composition and volume are altered by a combination of ultrafiltration, convection, and diffusion. Let's look at the setup for each of these three procedures. In dialysis, the patient's blood flows through the hollow fiber dialyzer in this direction. Dialysate flows through the dialyzer cartridge, bathing the capillaries with metabolic waste products diffusing out of plasma into the dialysate. Note that the dialysate flows in the opposite direction from the patient's blood. This maximizes the concentration gradient between plasma and dialysate as much as possible along the length of the capillary. In other words, if blood and dialysate traveled in the same direction down the dialyzer capillary, by the time the blood had traveled the length of the capillary, much of its urea and creatinine would have diffused into the dialysate so that the gradient for diffusion would not be nearly as good. Having dialysate flow in the opposite direction allows the blood at the end of the capillary to meet fresh dialysate containing zero urea and creatinine, thus allowing efficient diffusion to continue. Ultrafiltration can also be employed by adding negative pressure to the airtight dialysis cartridge and pulling plasma through the capillary pores to reduce the patient's extracellular volume. Hemodialysis is typically performed in sessions lasting two to four hours. Here is an actual dialysis machine, and you can see the patient's blood flowing through the dialysis cartridge in this direction, its rate being controlled by a roller pump. The dialysate, meanwhile, is continuously made by mixing concentrated components with purified water from large tanks behind the machine, and it flows in this direction into the dialysis cartridge, back out again, and it's discarded down the drain after a single pass. The screen of the dialysis machine shows such data as the most recent vital signs, the patient's blood flow rate, the amount of ultrafiltrate to be removed from the patient during the session, here 4 liters at the rate of 950 cc's per hour, with 2422 already being removed, the amount of time left in the dialysis session, 1 hour and 41 minutes out of 4 hours, the temperature to which the patient's blood is warmed in the tubing while it is outside of the patient, the flow rate and composition of the mixed dialysate, and the pressures within the blood lines that are leaving the patient, negative because the roller pump is pulling blood out, and returning to the patient, positive because the blood is being pushed back into the patient's vein. Note that with both dialysis and CBVH, when a dual lumen dialysis catheter is used for access, the exiting and entering bloodlines are actually both venous blood. They are labeled arterial and venous only so that we can keep track of which one is leaving the patient and which is entering. In CBVH, the patient's blood again flows through a hollow fiber hemofilter, which is similar to a dialysis cartridge, but smaller, since the blood flows needed for this 24-hour procedure are lower than those needed for a four-hour dialysis. The droplets of ultrafiltered plasma are collected in large bags and measured and are replaced with a dialysate-like replacement fluid, which can be infused into the blood circuit either before or after the hemofilter, or both. The patient's extracellular volume is altered simply by adjusting the balance between the volume of fluid pulled off by ultrafiltration and the volume added as replacement fluid. Replacement fluid is essentially the same as dialysate, containing little or none of solutes to be removed from the patient's blood, such as creatinine, urea, phosphate, and potassium, larger amounts of solutes to be added from the fluid to the patient's blood, such as bicarbonate, and normal concentrations of solutes that usually do not change much during dialysis, such as sodium, chloride, and calcium. And of course, there are no proteins or big molecules. The big question about replacement fluid is, 
Where in the circuit should it be infused, before or after the hemofilter? Post-filter seems to make intuitive sense so that fluid can be removed by ultrafiltration, then immediately replaced with urea-free, creatinine-free fluid. But the problem with post-filter replacement is that pulling off large amounts of fluid by ultrafiltration increases the hematocrit and protein concentration of the remaining blood, leading to clogging of the hemofilter pores, which is made even worse by adsorption of protein molecules to the filter membrane. However, this problem can be partly counteracted by increasing the blood flow rate in the filter because the sheer effect of blood flow tends to decrease protein adsorption. On the other hand, infusing replacement fluid before the filter keeps the pores from clogging, but results in removing some of the fluid before it ever reaches the patient and diluting the concentrations of stuff to be removed before the fluid gets to the hemofilter. In some institutions, ours included, a mixture of pre-filter and post-filter replacement is used to avoid extremes of the pre- or post-filter problems just described. Here's how a CVVH machine looks. Again, we have the patient's blood running through the hemofilter, its rate being controlled by a roller pump. And ultrafiltrate is collected in one bag while replacement fluid is infused before and after the hemofilter. The second type of CRRT commonly used in the ICU is CVVHDF, continuous venovenous hemodiafiltration, which is simply a combination of CVVH and dialysis. Here the patient's blood passes through the hemofilter and large amounts of ultrafiltrate are removed and then replaced with creatinine and urea-free replacement fluid. But now the blood in the hemofilter is also exposed to dialysate, which enhances solute removal by using diffusion in addition to the convection that is already happening with CVVH. Now let's look at two more specific issues involved in choosing and running the different forms of RRT. We'll talk about vascular access and anticoagulation. Vascular access is via either a temporary or a subcutaneous tunneled central venous dual lumen dialysis catheter. As with most central venous lines, either the internal jugular with the catheter tip in the SVC or the femoral vein is used. The blood flow rate is controlled by a roller pump, so the central vein needs to be able to supply up to 400 mL per minute of blood flow. This is a dual lumen dialysis catheter, which is essentially two catheters placed side by side, each with its own lumen at the tip, and each with its own side pores, allowing for better blood flow. Blood flow is in this direction, and the exiting blood is pulled from the more distal pores, while the returning blood enters more proximally to minimize mixing between dialyzed and undialyzed blood. In other words, you want to avoid returning freshly dialyzed blood to the patient only to have it pulled right back out and sent back to the dialyzer. Anticoagulation is needed to prevent clotting within the tiny capillary fibers of the dialyzer or the hemofilter. If anticoagulation is contraindicated, periodic saline flushes may be used to prevent clotting. Otherwise, heparin boluses or infusions may be given. And more recently, the use of regional anticoagulation with citrate has become popular. With this technique, citrate is infused into the blood circuit before the hemofilter. It complexes with calcium, interfering with the normal process of coagulation as the blood travels through the capillaries. In order to avoid anticoagulation in the patient's circulatory system, calcium is infused just before the hemofiltered blood returns to the patient so that serum ionized calcium is normalized. In other words, only the hemofilter is anticoagulated, the patient's coagulation cascade remains intact. So to recap, citrate is given pre-filter and complexes with calcium to impair coagulation within the filter. Calcium is given post-filter and restores normal calcium levels and coagulation ability before the blood returns to the patient. The calcium citrate complexes that are formed are cleared in the effluent and also metabolized by the liver and muscles. 
This type of regional anticoagulation minimizes the bleeding risk for the patient and also can potentially decrease pro-inflammatory effects of ionized calcium. Things that could potentially go wrong with the complicated process of citrate anticoagulation include metabolic acidosis if citrate metabolism is impaired, for instance, because of liver disease, which allows citric acid to accumulate. You can also get metabolic alkalosis if the rate of citrate infusion is too high so that citrate is metabolized to bicarbonate. And you can get low ionized calcium levels if the citrate infusion rate is too high or if calcium rate is too low. Finally, let's summarize and compare the three different modalities of RRT that are most commonly used, hemodialysis, CVBH, and CVBHDF. Notice that the blood flow rates of the continuous therapies are lower than for a four-hour dialysis. Dialysate flow rates are also lower in CVBHDF, only 15 to 35 mLs per minute, compared with 500 to 800 for hemodialysis, again because of the 24-hour duration of the treatment. While hemodialysis can pull off 1 to 2 liters of fluid per hour net, CVBH and CVBHDF move several liters per hour all day long, but replace the volume so that the patient does not become intravascularly volume depleted or experience large swings in blood pressure. Notice that with CVBHDF, the amount of ultra-filtered fluid removed and replacement fluid added is often not quite as large as with CVBH alone because dialysis is helping to clear solute too. So the net fluid removal in all three therapies can be about the same, but is accomplished in 24 hours instead of four with the continuous modalities. Note that the clearances of small molecules in both types of continuous therapy are about the same. Even though CVVH uses convection only, while CVVHDF employs convection and diffusion. The reason for the equal clearances is that small molecules diffuse readily across the membrane so that they are very efficiently removed by either dialysis with diffusion or CVVH with convection. However, middle molecules, molecular weight 500 to 60,000, are more efficiently removed by convection than diffusion. So CVBH and CVBHDF are better at removing them than dialysis alone is. The reason this is of interest is that a recent study identified 67 so-called uremic toxins, the substances that make people sick in renal failure, 22 of which fell into the middle molecule range. Other potentially pathogenic middle molecules that have been shown to be cleared with the convective therapies include various cytokines, chemokines, myocardial depressant factors, and proteins involved in complement activation, all of which could play a role in patients with sepsis and heart failure. So the factors that we take into consideration when deciding on the best method of RRT for a particular ICU patient include things like these. If the patient has an unstable hemodynamic or volume status, or is at risk for cerebral edema, the slow continuous modalities are much better tolerated than a four-hour hemodialysis, which may induce wide swings in volume and blood pressure or rapid shifts between body fluid compartments. On the other hand, if the patient is hemodynamically stable but extremely catabolic, hyperkalemic, or fluid overloaded, the rapid removal of solute or fluid by hemodialysis may be needed. If middle molecule clearance is desired, CVBH or CVBHDF is the treatment of choice. So in summary, the types of renal replacement therapy that are available for use in the ICU setting include intermittent hemodialysis, which efficiently removes fluid and small toxins, but which may induce fluid and electrolyte shifts that are poorly tolerated by the very ill or hemodynamically unstable patient. For such patients, the continuous therapies, such as CVBH and CVBHDF, provide slow continuous removal of solutes and fluid, and in addition, do a better job of clearing so-called middle molecules that may play a role in producing disturbances seen in uremia and sepsis.
Make it set. And then you press the hours button to lock it in place. And now we're going to go back to modify defaults. And the next thing that I want you to go into is syringe. Yesterday, when we turned these machines on, your syringe brand was listed as Terumo. Terumo is just another brand of syringe. But it happens to be the factory settings. So if your machine's been worked on by Biomed, they can revert back to their factory settings. If I had used your machine yesterday and it was set up for a Terumo syringe and I was running heparin, your patient would not get the correct dose of heparin because of the diameter of the syringes. So that's why we've got to make sure that the machine and you, or your hospital, are on the same page. So yesterday we fixed the syringe brand so that it said BD. That has helped because I know nobody's been in here to work on your machines. But so you can know how to change it, press syringe brand, and now you can use your up and down arrows. If the bottom one doesn't move, try the top one. And you just page through until you come back to BD. Okay, make sense? Yes. Once you have BD, press the syringe brand again. And it's locked in. Go right in. And it's locked in place. All right? So when you're working with something and you press the button, the button grays out. And then when you want to lock that choice in place and you press the button again, that gray will go away. All right? Making sense? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's exit custom. We're back into our choose patient screen. And now everything's screened out. Same patient last history, download data. Can't do them. It's because we changed something on the machine. So we're going to pick a new patient. Okay? Per Johnny and Elton, your patient ID will be the FIN number. Got four class, so that I let Biomed know I was using these machines. On the left-hand side of that keyboard, there is a lock button. Press lock and type in test, T-E-S-T. -E this is our way of letting Biomed know I was using the machine for class. Test, T-E-S-T. That was way to myself this morning. 100. Enter. The hematocrit automatically defaults to 30. But if your patient has a hematocrit other than 30, you do not have to backspace. You do not have to press clear. You can just type the new number in. I checked your patient's labs, and they have a hematocrit of 27. Enter. Every three screens, you put something into the machine and says, hey, this is what you told me, is this what you meant? So I have a test patient that weighs 100 kilos and has a hematocrit of 27. If I needed to change any of those, that's what the numbers, are, that's what the soft keys at the bottom are for. But if your machine says test 100 kilos and 27, then we're going to confirm. So confirm. How do you set your machine up? Every patient, every time. Find the ACF button and press it. And every patient, every time is set up with what? Systemic anticoagulation. Press that button. Now, because it's a double, because it's a medication, the machine's going to do a double check. So we're doing the CBDHDF therapy performed utilizing the Prismaflex syringe pump. That is correct, so confirm. There's that third screen again, CRT, CVDHDF, and systemic anticoagulation. We can change any of them if we had to, but they look good to me, so let's press continue. Hey, now we're to the load set. Those circle things that you've been pressing, we call them bullets. So press your top bullet for me. Your picture changed. Press the next bullet. Coming down. Your picture changed. Press the rest of them. As you're on that step, 
the machine will change the picture. So you can press them all the way down. Alright? If you can read, follow pictures, you can do Christmas class. Alright? So the way this is going to work is on the bottom of your machine, you have a filter set. One person is going to do all of those bullets, load the circuit. Once it loads correctly, then we're going to unload that same person is going to unload it, and we're going to go down the line of everybody. All right? I'm going to use the machine that's in back here. So before you go grabbing, do not clamp anything. I know there's water in it. Leave it alone. I figure you guys would have worse things attached to yourself. <laughs> it is only saline. All right, when we go back in the room, I'll pull the one, and then you're going to do it. So pinch it and reach behind and pull it out. It's going to be real stiff because these are brand new machines. I want to get these two holes on these clips. All right. Pulling it out gives me more room to do that. So I'm just going to reach behind if I need to and finagle it around until those two holes go on those clips. Let me know when you're ready for me to move on. There's that picture again. Here's my pressure pot. The picture shows I've got one on the top and two on the bottom. So I'm going to come in at 10 and 4 and click to 12 and 6. One on the top, two on the bottom. Attach no pressure pots. One on the top, two on the bottom. Coming in 10 and 4, click into 12 and 6. Next one, snap the discharge ring into its guide, press the affluent line into the blood leak detector. So now it shows that I'm working with that yellow affluent line. So this is my yellow affluent line, this is my discharge ring. I'm going to, all right, a good way to remember this, you're going to turn your frown upside down into a smiley. Move it on. Temporarily hang your access effluent Y line on the priming hook. So the picture changes, shows me that I'm dealing with a Y, and that Y has my red and my yellow. So I go look at, and this is what I found. My yellow and my red, there'd be a spike here. All the ones we do is put it on a priming hook, just like that. Next bullet tells me to place the deaeration chamber in it, into its holder, <coughs> attach the chamber monitor line into the return pressure port. So the picture change shows me that I'm dealing with my return line. So we're going to deal with Pappy first. So sit Pappy in his chair, slide him on back, and then that top piece, we push first, and then we twist to the left. Okay? Moving on. Insert the return line into the air detector and return line clamp. Close door of the air detector. This is your air detector. It's got a little door. You have to pinch and pull it open. Your tubing is going to go in. We're going to close the door. And then this return line goes up to the left, goes up and down. See it? So we're going to put it, the tubing on the left and pull it in. Okay? Last one, open your affluent scale. So that's my yellow scale. So I'm going to open this up until it locks in place. So now this can come off and go on either side. This is my affluent bag. I want this tubing towards the front of the machine. Three hooks, three holes. Take this silver bar, it rocks right in here, just like that. Break the seal, close it, and locks in place. I went from top to bottom, and now I'm going to press load. 
if I've done anything with this carrier bar, it's going to push it all the way out, and then it's going to pull everything in. Guys, and it's reading your barcode. Now, right now, you see all this fluid moving around. Well, that's because we're reusing the circuits. In practice, you wouldn't see anything moving. Once I get to this screen, it means I did it right. So I have confirmed set loaded is the M150. Well, that's what the filter says. This is what the barcode reader read. These two black boxes are all the specs for an M150. Once I get here, I did it right. So now I'm going to unload, and it's going to take everything. I'm going to take everything down. You can work around. The doctor has ordered is what you're going to hang from the machine. We're using saline because it's cheaper. Okay, makes sense? Mm -hmm. So, like I've been saying all along, all of those saline bags have the spikes already in them. All of those bags have caps on them. Best practice for today is to turn that bag upside down, take the cap off, attach your line, and then flip it right side up. All right? I get the caps back because I refill those bags at the end of every day so that we don't have to have new bags every day. All right? This is going to be a group project, so everybody's going to prepare and connect your solutions so it's just connecting lines. Make sense? I liked your first board. It tells us to route the lines through the tubing guides, and the machine shows you where those tubing guides are. I actually skip this step when we're in class because I want you to have more play with the lines. So move on to the second board. It wants us to connect our access of fluid Y line to a priming bag. Those are those two really cool bags on the side of your machine. So you're going to take that Y, you're going to take the bag off, turn it upside down, take the cap off, connect the line, flip it right side up, and hang it on the hook. And I get the, and I get the caps. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Alright, next bullet. Your picture changed. It tells us to connect our pre-blood pump, which is the PDP, picture shows that's your white line. So you're going to pull that white scale out. Three hooks, three holes, just like last time. Find a bag of saline, don't care which one. Find your white line. Turn that bag upside down, take the cap off, connect your line, hang it on the center hook. Close your scale. <laughs> Keep on rolling. Connect the LSE line. Alright, so now we're moving on to the green dialysate scale. Same thing. Take a bag, put it upside down, take the cap off. Attach your line, hang it on the center hook, close the scale. So where do we get these? Will these be attached? Those will be attached on your lines. That's why I brought that package up so you could see. I'm going to do the video. <laughs> All right, you're moving on. Purple. Connect your purple. Yeah. That's your replacement line. So you pull that purple, purple scale all the way out. She's doing it here. So you watch it at home. Oh, take the last bag, turn it upside down. Hang your bag on the center hook. Yeah. Is there, right? <laughs> Thank you. And your last one tells you to connect your return line. Which line's your return line? 
Blue. 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 So that blue in practice, if it were still in the package, that blue would have a cap to it. And your bag would have a cap to it. You would take both caps off, maintain sterility, and connect them. You would maintain sterility. Everybody get that? So there. This one, where does it show? Oh, it's the one. Okay. What's up, guys? What's the question? This machine was designed by engineers. And I love engineers. My son in law is an engineer. I love him to death. But if any of you know engineers, they are very slow and methodical. We're going to do this, and then we're going to do this, and then we're going to do this. Nurses are 45 steps ahead, and that engineer is still going, we're okay, we're doing this, and this. <laughs> and look what comes up next. It is time for my syringe. On the bottom of your machine, you have a syringe. But before we go grabbing it and getting all excited, <laughs> she grabbed it already. <laughs> I want you to look in that white bar. All right? Look where it says allowed syringe. If this said anything other than a VD20, the cutting. If this said on your machine anything other than BD20, the cursing would begin. <laughs> because what you would have to do is you would have to cancel this screen. That would take you back into your solution screen. You would then have to remove all the solutions from the scales and cancel that screen. That would take you back into the load unload screen. You would have to unload your machine. Take everything off. Then you would have to turn your machine off, turn your machine back on, go into custom mode, and fix it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Somebody that has done match cursing on this screen to open the plunger clamp latch. So that's that bottom piece, that's what your picture shows, pull it away from the machine. Uh -huh. All right. Okay. <laughs> Did you pull it away from the machine? Yeah. Okay. There are more instructions on that first bullet. What else does it tell us to do? No. Sorry. We're still at the first one. Press auto down. Press auto down. Anytime you see something in all capital letters, it's going to stop. Press that auto down key, and that syringe pump arm is dropping down. Everybody's like, Also on that screen, it says remove syringe if already attached. That's because this is the same instructions you're going to follow if we're changing out the syringe. All right? I like your second point. Free the syringe line from the outermost clip. So all that means is that when we package them, that tubing is right next close to the machine. That's already been pulled out yesterday, and then it tells you to connect your syringe. Now, all of those syringes should still be in your hands because we have not moved on. Highlight your next bullet. Place the syringe in the holder. Wings in the syringe holder slot. Okay. So wait one second. Let me give you a little helpful hint on this one. You will know that you've done that correctly. Please grab the barrel of your syringe. That's where the fluid is and try to move your syringe up and down. Does it move up and down? No. No, then it is in the right way. All right? That's one of the biggest 
things yeah, that yeah, nurses right. have. Mm -hmm. okay. So, but my needs need to be out. Yeah. Yeah. So you're an ICU nurse. What do you think? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you need to see it how much. It doesn't matter for the machine that I know what matters for your own city. Right? Press on a lot. You got another soft key. <laughs> we're, like, we're all like laughing. All right. Are we going to the same? Perhaps it's a little bit of a bubble. Exactly. Last bullet, my friends. Close plunger clamp flat. Close plunger clamp flat. Quick, quick. Quick. And press to sing you. Because it's a medication, it wants to know, are your syringe wings secured in the hole or slot? Is the syringe line unclamped? And is that plunger clamp latch closed? If all of those three don't happen, and you were ordered heparin, if they weren't done, the machine's not going to be able to, that's why it's doing a double check. Okay, if you can verify all three, then press confirm. You guys just sit there for a second, let us catch up. So no. All right. Huh? And now, in that white bar, more information tells us that we need two liters of prime. The allowed syringe brand and size is a BD20. Make sure to unclamp any clamp lines. Well, you pulled it out of the package unclamped. You should have left it unclamped. We would verify that all our connections are tight and secure while it's still in the packaging. Okay, that way nothing falls on the floor. Now you've got two choices on this screen. There's a prime and a prime plus test. There are some facilities that like to over prime their circuits. They can only pick prime. Here at Valley, we're going to do a two liter prime, so we're accepting the default on the machine. So we're going to press prime plus test. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't think so because we're just mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, it did. Mm -hmm. yeah, it did. yeah, that drawing, that last one. So, I don't know. I guess. Close. Press the last one. The last one. See what it does. Oh, this one? Oh, okay. And then. So, unfortunately, yeah, you got to everything again. So, that means you got to pull this open. Aye, aye, aye. Come on back to me a minute. It tells us uh -oh. you've got a scale open. Which scale is it? Which look on your machine. Yellow. Look on your machine. Which, which line is it? Yellow. All right. Is there any? Is that scale open? Is it locked in place? There you now go. Now it is. Press continue. <laughs> Okay. Now it's this angry. <laughs> so mute is your best friend. Now, what does it tell you to do? So open that scale, pull it all the way out till it locks in place, then close it. And then what does it tell you to do? Retest. Retest. Now I'll let it tap. Alright? So if you have to follow the directions, Chris Flex is going to yell at you. Okay? Plain and simple. All right? Now, it says that we are pri our priming is complete in seven, eight minutes. We are in our first prime. Cycle one of two is in progress. 
The next intervention will be in either three or five minutes. That'll be changing out your bag. And then the machine's going to do its prime test after so it's done. Is it is it all right? Hating? If we were in practice, what you would be doing right now is checking that access, making sure it works. All right. Check your orders. <laughs> but before you do that, I want you to go to your charge nurses, your physicians, anybody that has something to say about your patient, and say, hey, I'm getting ready to start CRT in my room. That's usually enough of a clue for your physicians to go, oh, you're doing that now. I really need that stat, head, chest, abdomen, pelvis, and please get it. That's what you hear. Then tell them to get that test done now. The reason why it's so important is for what we talked at, what we were at, what I was asked when we were still in the room. Immediately after the machine has gone to the priming and prime test, the patient needs connected into therapy. So no lag times. The reason for that is because what's going on in priming is we're actually rinsing the, the sterilant that we use into your effluent bag. The sterilant that we use is a gas called ethylene oxide. Ethylene oxide is a powerful vasodilator. For that reason, immediately after priming a prime test, the patient has to go into therapy. If that can't happen, if something goes wrong and we can't put that patient into therapy, we're going to get a point of no return on this machine, and I'm gonna let you know where that's at. If we're not ready to go into therapy, we're gonna let the machine sit on that screen and then take the patient for the test. When they come back, we'll reprime the circuit. Okay? Making sense so far? All right? You good? Yes. So if we had everything hooked up, but we hadn't pushed the prime yet, and then we had to go for a test, could we just wait? Or is it just you could. Okay. Okay? All right? Any other questions? Is it making sense? Yes, no, maybe so. Okay. So on the left hand side of your machine, you have another very full bag of saline. I get those half partially full bags back because I'll read a little bit much. And you're going to connect your next line. So. How much do you lose? Not much. Okay. So it should have. Okay. So they already have spikes on, so just recap for me. Here's the bag. Okay. So did you put the new one on? Yes. And then what do you think you're going to do? Next cycle. Next cycle. It goes right back in front. Making sense? Yes. Any questions? Any questions? Who should mind? Where are you getting fluid from? How much am I going to drain? 3,000 3, plus my fluid Yes. Right? Yes. Okay. Well, let's say something goes wrong and this line gets blocked. Now I've got 2,000 going in. I'm draining 3,000. Where's that extra solution going to come from? Or what's the only place I have left? Your patient. Yeah. Well, all right. What if your affluent line gets blocked? Now I've got 3,000 going into the circuit and no place to put it. Where's it going? Back to your patient. patient. Everybody get that? Mm -hmm. Over a three hour period. So, if you forget, and let's say you change out your dialysis line, but you leave it cleaned. Well, machine's designed to pull solution from that bag. Can't get it from that bag, so it's going to pull it from your patient. If it is a pre blood a dialysate, or a replacement, one of those lines that I'm trying to pull solution from, if I can't get it from the bag, I'm going to get it from your patient. Excess loss. If it's your affluent bag, 
and it's clamped I can't dump into the affluent bag I'm going to dump into your patient excess gain what will happen is the machine will give you a flow problem it'll tell you which one of these lines it is it'll tell you to look for a clamped or kinked bag it'll tell you to make sure that all of those scale all of those bags are free hanging making sure that there's nothing up against those scales okay if you look down and you say oh my god i left the dialysate bag clamped and you unclamp it the machine's going to reverse what it just did so if it pulled an extra 22 cc's from your patient it's going to stop that fluid removal until we catch up okay that's why it's over a three hour period the alarm that you will see will be a flow problem. Those bags, those crystal saw bags, have the ability to spike and lure. Like I said before, I would recommend using the lures because this is a one-way valve. But if you've used the lures and you're getting a flow problem and you look and everything's open, nothing's just, nothing's supporting that weight, disconnect the line from the bag and reseed it. It might be we didn't catch those threads just right. Okay? If it continues to happen, there's probably something wrong with this valve and we need a new bag. Okay? The reason why it's so important first time you do it it'll be 20 cc's next time it'll be 40 and 60 and 80 clear up to a little bit over 400 if the problem continues to happen at a little bit over 400 it becomes a hard stop the only thing the machine will allow you to do at that point is return your patient's blood put up a new circuit they're not using that one anymore okay this has nothing to do with your fluid removals this is for those oops, left one. Make sense? Any questions about this? All right. No further priming can be done beyond this screen. If our patient is not good to go, we're going to let the machine sit on this screen. And then when that patient does come back to the unit and we're all good to go, in the bottom right left hand corner there's a reprime button everybody see it that would require two bags of saline and we would reprime the manual prime next button in if you're in a hurry to start therapy you would use one bag of saline but you have to press and hold the manual prime for about half a bag okay makes sense Okay. Your patients are all good to go because on the right hand side of your machine you have another bag of saline that has a smiley face on it and it has a blue lemon catheter hanging out the bottom. That would be Mr. or Mrs. Saline every day to your patient. Alright? So we're going to go through this screen. Number one says that we are testing the remote alarm system and you should have a red flashing light on top of your machine. Do you have a red flashing light on top of your machine? Yes. Okay. Number two. Inspect the crystal flex set for air. Hey, you got any air bubbles? No. Okay, I'm, I'm hearing some on the affluent line. Do we need to worry about that? It's too small. On the affluent line? On that Where are they going to wind up? In the bag. In the bag. Anybody, any place else? It's going to go to the field. Mm, nope. Really? Because this would be the first time that I've ever had a circuit without air bubbles. The filter. Ah, uh, the filter, yeah. Right? Okay. Hey, look. Do I have to return the patient? Do I have to return the patient? Yeah, we do. Don't worry about it. It's going to go into the machine. All right? So, what I want you to do is I want you to tap that filter till you can get a couple of air bubbles that you can see. So bring them up so that they're sitting on that return line. All right? Can everybody see an air bubble? Mm -hmm. All right? 
Press and hold your manual prime. See where they wind up. Press and hold. Hey, where'd Yay. you go? <laughs> Happy. That's why it's there. Go into the bag. <laughs> okay, just be careful because those you're working off those priming bags on the side. That's why I overfill them. Actually, going to tell me to clamp that blue side clamp, and when I clamped it, I clamped it where I found it, and when I disconnected the lines in the bag, I actually shot there all the way back to that clamp. Best practice: when the machine tells you to clamp a line, take that slide clamp all the way up to the hub where the bag connects. Clamp it there, you won't pull air back. Make sense? Yeah. All the way up there. We're not doing it yet because the machine hasn't told us to. But does that make sense? All right. Number three tells us to inspect the fluid level in the deaeration chamber. Is it where it needs to be? No. 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 If needed, use adjust chamber. So press the adjust chamber button. Adjust chamber. So press the adjust chamber button, release it. Get used to seeing this screen. Use your up and down arrow, put it where it belongs. You're going to press and hold. It's going to move slow. It's going to look like it's not moving at all. All right? That's all the way to the line. You guys. All right? So listen. So I know that there are times when you'll get busy and you might forget to check that chamber. If you come into your room and you see that that chamber level is super low, like this machine right here, and they're pressing and holding and pressing and holding and pressing and holding, it's moving real slow, at some point it's going to stop and you may not be back up to that level. If that's the case, you just hit the maximum amount that will let go in at any one time of eight mils. If you're not up to that level, what you would do is press confirm level and go right back into adjust chamber. You have another eight mils. Make sense? Once everybody's happy with their fluid level, there. Press confirm level. Yeah. 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 Okay. Number four says if your patient is ready to connect, they're on the side of your machine, they're ready to connect. Press continue. Okay. So the first thing that comes up is that excess gain or loss limit of 400. Everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. There was um, a small patient. Your physicians could write to change that limit. It can be changed down, but it cannot go up. Okay? Most of the time, all the time, Valley's going to accept the call of the machine. All right? So confirm that, please. And now we're ready for our doctor's order. Looking at your doctor's order right now, they've ordered a blood flow rate of 250. So find blood. Put it at 250. Your free blood pump. Free blood pump is 1,000. Oh, it's going to move go. slow and then it's going to start to jump. You're going to 1,000. <coughs> Your dialysate, 1,000. Oh. Your replacement, 1,000. Mm 
Valley is going to accept the default on the machine of post filter replacement. We're going to leave the patient floor removal set at zero. We'll talk about those calculations after lunch. So your machine should currently say 250, 1000, 1000, 1000, post, and zero. If it says that, please press confirm all. First thing that comes the next thing that comes up is our anticoagulation settings. If you look, we're talking continuous rate here. Everybody see where it says the continuous rate is zero mils per hour. Is that how we normally do heparin? No, we do heparin in units per hour. So the default of the machine or Valley's choice is that you would run 1,000 units per hour. Okay, that's what their suggested dose is. And it just so happens that the concentration of your heparin will be 1,000 units per cc. So if my physician wanted 1,000 units per hour, what would I be setting that continuous rate for? One. One. We're going to leave it set at zero because it's only saline. Saline. Make sense? Mm -hmm. On your order sets, we also have the ability to deliver a bolus dose of heparin at the beginning of therapy. See that third button over that says bolus delivery? Mm -hmm. We're not going to go into that right now because I can only bolus my patient once I'm in therapy. So we'll come back to visit that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. All right? We're leaving it the continuous rate set at zero because it's only safe. Everybody good? Mm -hmm. Press confirm all. Every three screens you put something in the machine and says, hey, this is what you told me. This is what you meant. My blood flow rates at 250, all of my solutions are running at 1,000. I'm not taking any fluid right off, off right now. Underneath that, my treatment, my excess gain or loss limit is set at 400. That's that little hose I just do Above that, all the way up to the top of the page, I have a patient by the name of Test. They weigh 100 kilos. Down underneath that in that black box, my anticoagulation settings are there. I'm running a continuous rate of zero. Last thing on there is prescription indicators. Everybody see the thing that says a fluid dose? Yes. What's your fluid dose? 30. 30, 30 mils per day per hour. That's the dose we talked about in class. We want the Nego recommends to deliver a dose of 20 to 25 mils per day per hour. 30 mils per day per hour will cover your downtimes. The way that a fluid dose is calculated, I have 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 running through the machine. So my patient weighs 100 kilos. 3,000 divided by 100 gives me my fluid dose of 30. Make sense? Yeah. Good, let's continue. Okay, now we're ready to connect our patient. That white bar tells us to perform the steps below, so highlight your first bullet. Tells us to clamp all Y lines. There's two white slide clamps on your priming bag. Two white slide clamps on your priming bag. Clamp those. There are more instructions on that line. What else does it want me to clamp? Access is what? The access. What color? What color is your access, please? Red. And your affluent, which is yellow. yellow. And your return, which is blue. So, my friends, you should be clamping five lines two whites. A red, a yellow, and a blue. Okay. Making sure that blue clamp is all the way next to your bag so you don't suck air. All right? My friends, you should have two whites. A red, a yellow, and a blue. Five. No more, no less. Yeah. All right? I like your next bullet. We're going to disconnect our access line from our Y line. So which one am I pulling off? Pick your change. So you're going to take your red line off that priming bag. 
and move it onto your patient. All right. Oh, it's in a, in a bag. Got you. I like the next one. Disconnect the green line from your fluid collection bag. And put it to the blue when you're locking your patient's cabinet. Okay. And the next one. Disconnect your fluid line from your wand and put it to your fluid bag. Okay. Last bullet. Unclamp your fluid. Your access. Your return. And your patient catheter lines. So you should be unclamping five. A yellow, a red, a blue, another red, and another blue. And then your catheter line. Okay? Making sense? All right, let's continue. And now we're ready to verify our patient connection. Number one tells us to check our PVP access. That is not from the bag, that is from your patient. So go to your patient and start coming down that red line. See where that white line begins its infusion? Mm -hmm. On that white line there is a uh, slide clamp. Mm -hmm. That slide clamp looks exactly like the slide clamps on your priming bag. And Prisma Flex knows nurses like to clamp things. All it is telling you is to make sure that is unclamped. <laughs> All right. Are your access and returns connected to your patient's catheter? Clamps on your access and return lines are open. Clamps on all unused lines are closed. What's the only line that I'm not using? The prime. Right. The prime. Those are already clamped. There's something else. What do I have programmed to run at zero? A syringe. Oh, it's a syringe. Oh, syringe. To plant your syringe. All right. So my next question. You got that priming bag hanging on the left hand side of your machine. What are you going to do with it now? Just go. Change. What, what do you think you would do with it? The apple. The no. The priming bag. Change it. What are you going to do with it? Get rid of it. Get rid of it. I don't know how many units I've walked on and seen those stupid priming bags hanging there. Are you going to ever use that rest of that saline? No. Get rid of it. Okay? Really don't really give somebody the brilliant idea that they want to connect something to that. <laughs> Throw it away. All right? Make sense? Mm -hmm. Let's press start. Hey, I've got a green light on top of my machine. It's working. This is known as your status screen. It's where we want to live, work, and breathe. Coming down on the left hand side is a prescription cap that has my doctor's order. So I've flow rate 250, all my solutions try to live with us. If I needed to change any of those, that's what that black adjust button in the middle of the page is for. Right up from that black adjust button, there is an info tab. On that info tab right now, there is a lowercase letter I surrounded by an orange border. Everybody see it? Yes. Mm -hmm. That happens when the machine first turns on. See all those pressure bars, access, filter, fluid, uh, effluent, and return? They're all grayed out. That's because when that orange border is there, the machine is trying to figure out where that circuit likes to live with that patient. Once it figures out its happy spot, that access, filter, effluent, and return will have a green area, a yellow area, and a red area. That black diamond that's on those pressure bars right now is the minute-to-minute pressures being generated by the machine. Okay? 
says four minutes. That play button actually tallies up run times for filters one through ten. On the eleventh one it goes back to zero. Then we have a clock. Right below that I have another play button that says C V B H D F. Based upon the prescription that is in the machine right now, that's what my patient is receiving. Then I have a pictogram of a prescription pad. Also says C V B H D F. That's how the machine is set up. Mm -hmm. If I wanted to change any of those, I, if I got a new doctor's order, I would go into that black adjust button. So we're going to change your doctor's order. I just got a call. They want to change the doctor's order. So adjust. We're going to go PDT. So find the PDT button. Your doctor has ordered that to run at zero. So press and hold. Mm. Okay, dialysate to zero. Replacement to zero. Our patient fluid removal is set to 10. Your machine should now say either 250 or 300, zero, 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 post in 10. If it does that, confirm all. Everything grays out again while it's fine in its happy spot. And look in the upper right hand corner. Based upon this prescription, the machine is currently delivering. All I have to do is zero, zero, zero. Okay? When you do your charting, you will be charting your access, filter, effluent, and return pressures every hour. There are two more numbers that you're going to have to record. Those are found on the TMP tab. So go into the TMP tab. TMP. There's two numbers there. Pressure drop and TMP. The pressure drop is the amount of pressure it takes to pull blood through your filter. Blood clots. So that pressure drop number is reflective of clotting. The TMP is the amount of effort that it takes to pull molecules across your filter. Mo molecules clog filters, so that TMP is reflective of clogging. Mm -hmm. We'll talk about those more after lunch. Okay, go back to the info tab. First button up 
we're going to talk about is stock aggressive. Stock. Um, that was the weights. S T O P. Okay. So we've got a resume button there, but let's talk about the other buttons. Change set. If you needed to change out your circuit, you would press change set. Go ahead and press it. What's the first option the machine gives you? Return blood. We're not quite there yet, so we're going to cancel that. Next button up is research. Go into that. Got two different choices for research. Saline research and a blood research. Look at the first line under saline research. What does it tell us to do? Return blood and set to the patient. Look at the first line under blood research. What does it tell us to do? Disconnect the patient. The difference between the two is that blood return. In a saline research, let's say your patient develops some mental status changes, they've got to go for a stat head CT. We would return the blood to the patient and the machine would be set up to circulate through a bag of saline, a liter bag of saline, for up to 120 minutes. Okay, patient comes back to the unit, we reprime the circuit, put them back in service, and we save the circuit. The other one, the blood research, does not return the blood to the patient, but the blood, patient's blood is set to circulate through a 100 mil bag of saline for 60 minutes. Those are for procedures that are done in your room. Okay? Right now, you do not have the ability to do either one of these processes because you don't have the supplies. All right? We don't have 100 mil bags because Baxter had a plant in Puerto Rico that was hit by an earthquake. And you don't have the Y connectors right now because they're on back order. All right? When I come back to do the second round of teaching, hopefully we'll have our act together. Hey, can you guess what the first one is going to be? Return the blood. Whenever we're doing something with that circuit, it's that important. Okay? We're not quite there yet, so let's press cancel and resume there. Okay? Next button up, change bags. Let's go into that. This is if you want to change a bag preemptively. Let's say you're in an isolation room and you look down and all oh, that bag will be empty before I get out of here. This will allow you to change all four bags at once. It doesn't care. But in that white bar, once again, it tells us to open only one scale at a time. So you can pull out the purple scale, change it, push it back in. Move on to the white one, change it, push it back in. Doesn't care. All right, you can pull out a scale now if you want. Just do not pull out the, the yellow ones because it will expect to see an empty bag, and I ain't got none. So pull out one of your solution scales. Pull it out until it walks in place. See how your picture changes? It's just a reminder of how to prepare your bag. Okay? Making sense? Mm -hmm. All right? So go ahead and close the scale. Don't forget to break it. Don't forget to break it. And it's got to walk in place. All right? Those are if you want to do it preemptively. If you don't, just let the machine run and it'll tell you the a bag's empty or your blood bag's full. Making sense? Okay, let's press continue. And all of a sudden, I ain't got no buttons to push. That's because on your info tab, it tells us that the self-test is in progress. The first self-test happens about 10 minutes into therapy. And then it will happen every two hours from this point on. If you look on that info tab, it tells us that the self-test takes one to six minutes. There is a delay test there, but I caution you from using it. It doesn't really make the test go away. It just postpones things by about ten minutes. And then when the machine does do a self-test, it will do a new self-test in any of the ones you've delayed. Best practice, let it run through. Okay? If you have used that delay test and 150 minutes have passed, the machine will give you an advisory alarm that tells you self-test is overdue. As soon as you clear that alarm, the machine's going to do a self-test. The only two buttons that are available for pressing right now are stop, we already did that, and history. Let's go into that. The history screen is your patient fluid removal. What's on that screen right now is the time when we started our machines. But if we had been running therapy on the unit, it would start 
with whatever time your new charting day starts. And it'll give you a line for every hour. So 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 24 hours worth of data on that screen. In the upper right hand corner, up and down arrows, that's how you page back through those 24 hours. The first column is what's going on right now. The next column totals everything up. Down below that, at the bottom, you have four circles. Everybody see a bottom left hand corner? Three black circles and a white one. The white one is today's worth of data. The other three are the three previous days. The machine will hold 96 hours worth of data. Mm -hmm. If we have been running continuous therapy and there was data on those other days, those black circles would have a white ring on them. If you forgot to write something down, that's what those arrows on the bottom are for. Okay, makes sense? All right, let's go fast. Status screen takes you back to the home screen. That's why it's called status. All right, making sense? And just like that, all of our bells and whistles are back. Next button up is change syringe. We're actually not going to go into that because I don't have any syringes to give you. But it's the same procedure we just saw. Next one is adjust chamber. Is your chamber level where it needs to be? <laughs> okay. If it is, need fix it, fix it. Nice. Okay. Alright, next button up is system tools. Let's go into that. Modify settings. Modify settings. Lots of choices on this page. The first one that I want to draw your attention to is the patient weight. You guys do dailies? Mm -hmm. The yes. weight is how the machine calculates the affluent dose. So it is going to be Valley's procedure that once you get that daily weight, you change it in your machine. So you would go to system tools, modify settings, check patient weight, press it, and change it. Make sense? Okay. You can also change the patient's hematocrit, but the hematocrit is how the machine uh, calculates something known as filtration fraction. The filtration fraction, you guys are not charting, so it's not nearly as important as that. Okay? The other one that I do want to draw your attention to is the chart reminder. All right? With their older softwares, the machine would beep at the top of the hour and let you know it was time to do your chart. The FDA said on the quieter machines, so that was an easy alarm for us to remove. Nurses liked it. They wanted it back, so we gave it back to you. So press chart reminder. Use your down arrow. That turns it on. Okay? Now at the top of the hour, you'll get a tone for the machine as reminding you your chart. If you decide that you like it, you have to add it every time you change out your circuit because it's automatically going to default. Okay? Press status, so it'll take us back to our home screen. System tools again, please. Next button up, clean screen. If you happen to notice that film, wipe it off with that alcohol wipe. Or if you forgot the top of the machine is curved and you put your graduate up there and now my machine's wearing GI drainage, you might want to wipe it off. That's what clean screen's for. Mm -hmm. Next button down is self-test. Let's go into that. You saw that when the machine was in self-test, it couldn't do anything with it. And so let's say you were headed into the room at the top of the hour and were in self-test. You can't put your new patient floor removals in. So the workaround, wait for the half hour to roll around. Come into system tools and trigger a self test on the half hour. What you've done is you've reset the clock. Now the machine will do its self test on the half hour. Okay? Sometime when you're not trying to program new values in. Alright? Its real purpose is if you don't like the pressures you've been getting, you think there's something you can do with the machine. Putting it into a self test will rebalance those pressure plots. Alright? Make sense? Alright? Let's cancel that. Let's go into system tools one final time. Last one up is normalized blood. Go into that. If you had a blood leak detected alarm, the machine would tell you to go into system tools and normalize your blood. Number one is required. 
it tells us to draw a sample from that affluent line. That's the top of your machine, that yellow sample port. It is not needleless. 21 gauge needle or smaller, and that's what I drew your attention to on your order set. We're asked to print to the Wadi cell count. Okay? That is the only time you will be drawing anything from this machine. Your machine says on number one, if blood is present, discontinue, press cancel, and change the set. You would not return your patient's blood. If no blood is present, you go to step two. Verify that the affluent line is installed in the blood leak and that the signal value is 38,000 or greater. All right, 38,000 is in that signal value. All right, if it weren't greater than 38,000, you do that flossing thing with the affluent line, make sure that it is, and then press start more. Okay? All that does is change the sensitivity on your machine. So now, It'll say, okay, I'm going to let Rapto pass, but I'm not going to.